Most of the visible church today is wrong about what Christ accomplished on the cross. They are under the impression that the blood of Christ has atoned for the sins of every person in the world, and salvation is contingent on whether someone accepts or rejects this offer of payment. This is called universal atonement. If you hold to this position, and you also care about what the Bible has to say about it, these arguments might change your mind. One of the most common tactics to attack the doctrine of limited atonement is to create an analogy around the idea that we are using the negative inference fallacy. I'll give an example. Christ did provide atonement for all people. Um, the negative inference fallacy is one of the fallacies that uh, Calvinists rest on pretty heavily here by saying, well, it says he lays down his life for the church, or it says he lays down his life for his friends. Therefore, he didn't lay down his life for anybody else. Uh, again, this is the negative inference fallacy. It's A keen observer will notice that while attempting to prove his claim that we are committing a logical fallacy, he makes one of his own. This one is called the false equivalency fallacy. And I'll explain how after his analogy. Like if I won the lottery and said, I'm going to pay for everybody in my church to go to um, the mission trip coming up this fall. Okay. Well, if I went to adult one and I announced adult one, hey, everybody in adult one, I want you to know your trip is paid for. If you want to go, you can go. Everybody in adult one, your trip is paid for. Well, because I said everybody in adult one, your trip is paid for, the negative inference fallacy would say, well, because Layton said that he paid for everyone in adult one, that means that only people in adult one have been paid for and not everybody in the church. In Layton's analogy, he is representing Jesus. The church is representing the world. Him paying for their trip is representing Christ paying for sin, and group one is representing the group of people that Jesus is referring to when he says that he lays his life down for his sheep. None of the things that are being compared in this analogy are similar. When Jesus spoke, he was infallible, and he never claimed that he was laying his life down for every person in the world. In fact, he said that the world would hate his sheep because he had chosen them out of the world. And he didn't pay for them to take a trip. He purchased slaves with his blood that were sold under sin. Jesus never referred to the church or his sheep as group one or the first group. In fact, he said that there is one body, the church and there was one flock. Let's hear another example of how someone might go about defending a universal atonement. With me here, this, this the format's important. I'm going to give you several other scriptures that will help support and bolster this interpretation I'm giving you because the interpretation works not only in 2 Corinthians, but it works in a lot of places throughout the Bible. And that's kind of how you can tell you, you're getting good theology, right? Is you apply the same principles to different passages and it's consistently accurate. It, it holds true. This is only true until you come across a passage that directly refutes the interpretation that you are applying to Scripture. The Bible is not required to spell out the entire doctrine of the atonement every time it mentions that Christ paid for sin. The doctrine of limited atonement is spelled out clearly in chapters like John 6, 10, and 17, Romans 8 and 9, and Hebrews chapter 7, 8, and 9. Okay, so... Here we go. Here's what I think is wrong with this interpretation. Um, I think all is all people in both uses. I think in the first one, Christ died for all. I think we're talking about all people. And I think in the second one, therefore all have died. We're also talking about all people. I think all of them. I think the difference here is, and, well, and you might think, wait a minute, Mike, that's universalism. You're saying that everybody, Jesus died for everybody and everybody died and therefore everybody's saved. No, I'm definitely not because I'm going to point out to you the difference between extent versus application. Immediately, the idea that the extent and the application of the atonement could be different is a red flag because that implies that there could be disharmony in the Trinity. The Father preordained the extent of the atonement before the foundation of the world. Then Christ performed the work on the cross and ascended to make intercession for the saints. And then the Holy Spirit 
finishes the application of the atonement through the gift of faith. If at any point you are tempted to make yourself the one who applies the atonement for your sin, not only are you making yourself the high priest who ascended and presented the sacrifice to the Father to make intercession for the saints, you are also removing the Holy Spirit's work in the process of salvation and replacing it with the idea of human freedom of will. The extent, remember our little graph? There's our little graph. The extent of Christ's death is he dies for all and all die. That's the universal atonement. Yet the application is a separate issue and we're going to come to that. That's actually going to be my focus. Um, this is why it's not universalism. Um, in extent, all died because Jesus successfully atoned for everyone. So he, in their position, died for them. So all died. That's just what it means that he died. Who did he die for? Everyone. So therefore, everyone died when Christ died. That's the condition theologically. That's the extent of the atonement. It's universal. So all is all in both passages. It means all people or in both um, phrases of that sentence. In application, though, only those who repent and believe will benefit because the gift already purchased must still be received. The application of the atonement is not universal. So it's universally provided, but not universally applied. So here's the question now. That's, that's the difference between extent and application. I think I've made that pretty clear. But the next question that I would have if I was listening to me right now is, okay, Mike, that's cute, but can you get it from the text? Can you show me that there is a extent versus application contrast in this exact passage in 2 Corinthians 5? And I think that absolutely I can. Um, and so that's going to be what I'll do uh, right now momentarily. Let's get back, get um, the scripture back up on the screen for you there. Okay, so um, 2 Corinthians 5, that was verse 14 and 15. We're going to look now in the same context. We're going to go down a few verses to verse 18 and read through verse 21. And we'll see that this extant universal versus application, not universal, um, that this is what's being uh, contrasted throughout the passage. So verse 18, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. That sounds like a universal salvation, right? No, no, no. That's universal atonement in extent. It extends to all people not counting their trespasses against them and not, and, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, or we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So we Notice that just before Paul says, be reconciled to God, he explains that it is God who is reconciling us to himself through Christ. So when Paul is saying this, he is expecting people to be reconciled to God through his preaching of the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation. He's certainly not expecting them to skip the entire message of the gospel and somehow figure out a way to reconcile themselves to God apart from what he just said. We have in verse 19 and verse 20 these two phrases that are really important. One says that the world was reconciled to God when Jesus died on the cross. The whole world. Everybody. Sinners. In fact, sinners is the idea. All the wicked people of the world. The world is not the elect. In any passage of scripture, the world is not referring to the elect. It's referring to the world system, those who were in rebellion to, against God, and God reconciled the world to himself through the cross. Then we have in verse 20, we go out appealing to people, now be reconciled. That's application. Jesus extant, he reconciled the world. Jesus in application now to apply that to your life. You need to come to God. You need to repent and believe. You need to trust in him. But the the the, uh, the deal's already been struck. The payment's already been made. The, the cost has already been, you know, accomplished. So that's the idea. And it's right here in the same passage. Verse 19, reconcile the world to himself, universal atonement. Uh, verse 20, Paul pleads and appeals, be reconciled to God. And who is he pleading with? He's pleading with people who are already reconciled in the extent of the atonement, right? The objective fact that Jesus has paid for everyone, that's already taken care of, but he's pleading with you as individuals, now come and be reconciled. Jesus paid for sin, now you give your life to Christ. It's already been accomplished. You just need to turn and believe. 
if turning and believing is not a result of the Holy Spirit's work in salvation, then now the burden is on you to explain how to change what you believe in your heart. There might be a few Reformed folks out there that are hesitant to stand before an audience and affirm particular redemption or limited atonement. I am not one of them. I believe, and my thesis statement for this debate, I believe that a consistent understanding of what Scripture teaches about the role of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in bringing about the self-glorification of the Trinity in the salvation of God's elect people requires and demands consistently an understanding that the atonement is in perfect harmony with the electing purpose of God the Father and the application of the Holy Spirit of God. You cannot have the divine persons working at odds against one another. And so when we go to Scripture, we don't go to passages that are just in passing making a reference here, a reference there, that are not about salvation itself. When we go to Scripture and ask what it teaches about God's purpose in salvation, about soteriology specifically, and about the impact and effect of the atonement, we see that the New Testament gives us a consistent testimony on these particular subjects. We don't have a lot of time, <clears throat> so I want to just simply lay out for you the fact that one of the most important realities about the Christian doctrine of atonement in the New Testament is that Jesus, as our high priest, is both, both the one who is offered upon the cross as well as the one who then presents that offering before the Father. As high priest, that's what the high priest did. Look at Leviticus chapter 16. On that Yom Kippurim, the Day of Atonements, he would take the blood of that sacrifice which had been offered, and he would go into the holy place, and he would sprinkle the mercy seat with that blood. Those were all pictures of the coming work of Jesus Christ. And so what that means is we have to bring together and keep together the biblical teaching of what the high priest did. So it's not just the offering itself, but then the intercession, the fact that the Son appears in the presence of the Father in our place and intercedes for us. What is he presenting? What is he doing? Is that some extra work beyond the cross? No, it is the presentation of that finished work, and that means we can look at what the New Testament teaches about intercession. And intercession is very clearly made for a specific people for one real reason. It always works. Anyone for whom the Son intercedes will be saved.